I've been focusing a lot. I believe it's the Lord's doing. But I've been focusing a lot on eyes, on the eye, the human eye. And so you see my title there, Optics Versus Reality. Uh, last week I preached something about the eye, and I think the week before that, but it was, it's not the same sermon, but I'm concentrating a lot on things as they appear and as they really are. Uh, how do I sound? Do I need to take a, a little, take this down a little? We okay? All right. All right. That was a beautiful song. And thinking of seeking first the kingdom of God, being able to weigh the things that we see uh, by our eyes, also looking at them as how God would look at them. I want us to sing another song, if you don't mind, if you'll follow me. It goes like this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be in your house. Thankful, Lord, that through the eyes of faith, we can see things as they truly are, not as they appear. Touch us, Lord, as we open your word. Please open our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Optics versus reality. I guess we need a definition of optics. And if you want to turn in your Bibles, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Okay, here's a definition of optics. Optic, optics are the way something looks to an outsider, and I'm watching the clock, especially concerning political actions. And this is the example I copied and pasted. This is not mine. A politician playing golf during a violent protest in their home state would be an example of bad optics. Doesn't look good. And another definition, well, continuing, it says, typically in a political context, the way in which an event or course of action is perceived by the public. And those of us with a view of the great controversy should kind of know where I'm going with this. And I had to, Chuck, limit myself. That's why I had to go with the slides. <laughs> oh, play for my niece. She's going through something. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I had to limit myself because I had a flood of information that we would be here for two hours talking about this, and I don't know if you want to do that today. So I'm going to limit myself to the, by these slides. Okay, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, southwest Atlanta. The SWATs is what we call it. I don't know. I don't think any, I don't think any of you are from the south or from Atlanta. <laughs> but we had, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but did you grow up in a, in a city with a, a rail system, subway, and buses to go throughout the city? I grew up in with, uh, with that as a part of our infrastructure. And for a small fee, you could get on the bus, and you could get on the train and go anywhere in the city, basically. Buses running all throughout the city. And one of the things that I would see when I get on the bus is people playing cards, a lot of interesting conversation, but a lot of attention on this game called Three Card Monty. And when you get on the bus and you don't, you're not familiar with this, what you would witness, the optics that you would see, is a man with three cards. <laughs> and he's playing this game. He shows one card, and you're supposed to be able to pick that card out when he's shuffling it, when he's shuffling and moving it around. And you, as the observer, you're watching someone come and place a bet. People come and place bets. And they, they, look, they just look horrible because it's like you're thinking, how could they get this wrong? You see where it is. You're not playing, but you see where the card is. And people keep picking the, the wrong thing and having to pay money. 
Then maybe someone will come and win a couple of, uh, of hands. Then you, as the ignorant observer, <laughs> would, would get involved because you're thinking, wow, $10 a hand, $20 a hand. You may have your lunch money or some money that your mom gave you for a trip. You would be tempted to put that up because it seems like it was, you saw all the, all the cards. You, you knew where they were each and every time, even though the people who were actually playing was getting them wrong. So let's look at a technical definition for it. Three card money is also known as find a lady and three card trick. It's a confidence game, a con game, in which the victims or marks are tricked into betting a sum of money on the assumption that they can find the money card among three face down playing cards. Now when you go and you put your money up as the real person, as the person that's uh, taking this bet, those hands move a lot faster. And what you don't realize is those people that you saw losing money were in cahoots with the dealer and they were splitting the money that, you know, they would split that money at the end. So it would be very enticing. This is just an example of how optics can lead you to make a bad decision. What you're watching is not always reality. And I put this in there, I, I didn't want to forget it. There are games that may cause us to lose money, but in the great controversy, this battle between Christ and Satan, and that battle is for your mind. It's for my mind. There are much higher stakes. I think it's important that we understand what we see, uh, that we understand what we see not merely by visuals, but we need to see it from God's point of view. What do you say? We have choices to make in this life. And choices are often made, well, they're always made based on the information or the data that you are trying to uh, interpret. So here we have decisions. Luke 16 is our text. Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, God in this world. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And Jesus said unto them, you are they that, you are they that which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. That which looks good in the world, good optics. God has a lens that can peer into it much more closely. And he is not fooled by the things that people put forth to, for others to see. He looks a little deeper. You, are, you know the story. There's a, a prophet who was sent to the house of Jesse. To, to interview and to look at which son that God would have anointed as the next king of Israel. And you have all these strapping young men out there, and David wasn't even in the house. And we see a very important principle here. Uh, just, before, uh, just before the time that the prophet says, Where, are these all the sons you have? And he said, oh, yeah, I got another one, a little runt. David, he's out there tending sheep. God sees things differently than we do. And here it is, a very important principle. This is a principle text in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. It says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance. This is when uh, one of the, the boys was, was there that was not going to be anointed. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? On our hearts. The world is watching, and so is heaven. You think about your life. You don't think about someone watching you. I don't know if you binge watch or you watch TV. You don't think about it, but you are the subject. You are the theme. I would call it a, a I don't know if we would call it a sitcom. It would probably be a tragedy com or a, 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 a sit tragedy. We, they, they are watching us. We are being watched. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 9. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a what? What's that word? A spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And I believe that world there is cosmos, universe. Probably includes more than one world because world and men, that would be the same thing. Unto the worlds, to angels, and to men, Paul says. You think the enemy is aware of this? <laughs> PR, that's a word that stands for public relations. Uh, that's a very important uh, field to be in. And some people, man, they may be true at heart, but if they don't have a good PR person, they could look evil. 
And some people, though they may be evil, if they have a great PR person, they can come across looking pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nice, very nice. So public relations and the minister of disinformation, who do you think that is? Who was it who was entrusted with the, the ability and the, the, the office of going and speaking to the angels? Who would leave the very presence of God with his light shining, he would come and reveal the will of God. He was able to deceive angels in heaven. He was able to deceive all of humanity on earth in the persons of Adam and Eve. They represented all humanity. That's why Revelation says he comes and he deceives the whole world. He does it through disinformation, disinformation and bad press. And so I want to just look at a few optics. There were so many texts that I was considering when looking at this. And Harold, you just came back from uh, the capital. We know that our country is in turmoil. It is truly divided. It's, and no matter how much we can sing the Star Spangled Banner and, uh, or whatever else we may sing, uh, it, it has become so divided that when you are looking at an inauguration or, some, inauguration or something to that effect, it's like the Super Bowl, where one side is happy as a lark and the other one is, is, is suicidal almost. But we're not together. So there's optics. There are optics that are used to induce uh, a lot of things. One of them is fear and willingness of the public to give up liberties. How do you feel about liberty? You know, America ha is that, that beast in Scripture that has how many horns? It has two horns, like a lamb, the Bible says, Revelation 13. Those two horns, those two horns do not have crowns. That's symbolizing civil and religious liberty, no pope and no king. How would you get people in America to give up their liberty? You do it through optics, and you do it through fear. Well, I'm going to show a few pictures of an attempt to use fear to, and using fear in the taking away of liberties and how it sometimes backfires. You remember the 60s, right? Two horns like a lamb, but it spake as a dragon. That's all that the Bible says about America. You know, there are other things that you can fill in. And typically, in my, in my background, I have a heart for this. I'm not unpatriotic. I'm, I do not hate the United States of America. But I have, in Atlanta, is I don't know what percent black. It's just everybody's black. I didn't see white people until I wanted to see white people. I would go weeks or months. We had a couple. I had a white teacher, a white principal. It seems like teachers, uh, educators, police, and people looking for drugs, those were the only white people I saw in my neighborhood in my life. Now, if I, if I wanted to interact with white people, I would go out of my way to do that. So when you think of someone from the South, you might think of racism and all these things. I can't identify with that because everyone in power, everyone that I depended on for anything in Atlanta was black like I was. But before that, before my time, there was actual discrimination and racism. Uh, two horns like a lamb, speaking as a dragon. We often interpret that as it has two horns like a lamb, but eventually it will speak as a dragon because we're only focusing on one horn, and that is religious liberty. But civil liberty is another horn that we have struggled, and it's been an optic more than a reality in this country, I'm afraid to say. And you don't have to just deal with blacks. You deal with the Native Americans. You look at the Japanese after, after the war. And a lot of things that have happened in this country that some people will not be so surprised that this country will speak like a dragon. And um, here's some more pictures. This is a dog being put on. And these, these people, they understood what they were doing, right? I look at them like I look at the men, who, the men and women who fought on our fields to assure liberties that they knew that they would not have. I mean, it's just like being, being a soldier. And I, I look at the way that they were dressed. They had a strategy to their optics. And optics is not always a bad thing. Martin Luther King said this is going to be peaceful. We're going to be dressed nicely. We're not going to look like... People are going to be able to tell immediately who the bad guy is when they look at these pictures. It doesn't take you a long time to figure it out. And I know we have children, so I kept them. A lot of, there are pictures that are bloodier and, and a lot more intense than the ones that I'm showing you. That's John Lewis, who just uh, recently passed uh, in the light trench coat there. And this is him being beaten. People pick on his voice because he, he has a speech impediment, but it's something that he was not born with. It's something that he got from being beaten so many times uh, in these protests. 
And these were righteous protests, righteous protests, very important. And the optics were saying, look, look at what we're going through. There was a group of people who were saying that they were superior. And there was another group of people who were being rated as inferior. And this is not about black and white. This is about fear and tactics and optics. And this was, they were successful because when people turned on their TVs and saw this, it won sympathy. Now, if, if it was just an a, a even match fight where the people are attacking and tearing down and burning things, I don't think they would have gotten that sympathy. But they were able to arouse the sympathy of the on, onlooker because, look, it's obvious that this is not right. To have water holes, uh, I, 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 I detail cars, you know, and I've had pressure washers. You ever made a mistake and put your finger or your hand in front of that? It'll, it'll take your skin off. But these are high-pressure water hoses that they're putting on people. And there's videos of little girls in their Sunday dresses and their Sunday best tumbling like tumbleweeds across the street because someone turned a, a, a uh, fire hose on them to treat people like animals. But then for them to still have the dignity to say, you know what, I'm, I am a man. And this plan backfired, and it won the nation's sympathy. And soon, the Civil Rights uh, Act was signed in 1964. I want to look at a few statements from history. We're dealing with optics, the way things look and how they really appear. I mean, what they really are, what the reality of them. And how not to get caught up in optics and attempts to derail you from God's truth. Specifically, right now I'm thinking about giving up civil liberties or, or looking at the Constitution of the United States as a, a negative thing. As a black man, we were taught to hate the Constitution. I'm telling you it's in the enemy's interest to, to, to get people to, to de- belittle that document. That is the, the glue that's holding us together as a nation right now. And as that unfolds, as that falls, which it will, unfortunately, we will see America fall apart. We cannot stand without that document. Now, how was I uh, induced or what were the attempts on my life to hate the Constitution? Oh, well, you, you want to preach the Constitution? You were three-fifths of a human? You weren't even a human being when they wrote that. Well, that's been changed and ratified. Uh, that's been stricken out of the records. That was never in the, that was the in the Declaration of Independence, we understood that all men were endowed with certain inalienable rights. Beautiful. In, inalienable, that, that means it can't be taken away. It can't be interfered with. That all men are created equal, right? And so people would, that's the Declaration of Independence, they would say that doesn't apply to black people because they're only three-fifths of a human being, so that doesn't apply to you. Well, that clause, that has been taken out. And if you want to exclude yourself. This is me talking to myself. I want to exclude myself from, from liberties that this document is guaranteeing me that I'm losing, and I'm the one that's losing. So I am an American. I am a black American. I do claim those rights for myself. I don't relinquish them. You see how the enemy does? He makes you ashamed of, of, of upholding something that is well and good for you by making you hate it, and now you stand there. You strip yourself of the rights that the, that the document guarantees. So we're going to look at a few statements from history that reveal sentiments relating to liberty of conscience and constitutional principles. What are some things that have been said about those principles? This is Martin Luther King, Jr. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. There is nothing wrong with this. I can remember Paul Paul was taken, and they put their hands on him, and they bound him. And Paul came, and he, he was just telling his testimony, telling his testimony how God had delivered him from darkness and how he used to persecute the church. And so they said, no, put hands on him, and they commanded, one of the counselors there commanded that he would be flogged because he was looking at the optics. He didn't like what Paul was saying. And he said, let's flog him. And they were about to do that, and guess what Paul did? Paul didn't say... Well, uh, I'm thankful to suffer on account of Jesus' name. He didn't say turn the other cheek. Paul said, is this lawful for you to do this to a Roman citizen? He asserted his rights. And they got nervous and started shaking and looking around because this did not look good. They were about to be beating. They were beating a Roman citizen, someone who had rights. And Paul called them into account. And that is, that's what Martin Luther King Jr. and others are doing. 
if you say that this is the land of the free and the home of the brave, well, why don't we live up to that? Perfectly all right to do that. Abraham Lincoln, oh, man, he wrote so much. Our reliance in, is in the love of liberty, which God has planted in us. Anyone who hates liberty, do you know who you really hate? If you take someone's freedom away, you're playing God with their life, and you are warring against God himself. Our reliance is in the love of liberty, which God has planted in us. Our defense is in the spirit, which prizes liberty as the heritage of all men in all lands everywhere. Destroy this spirit of liberty, and you have planted the seeds of despotism at your own doors. Familiarize yourself with the chains of bondage, and you prepare your own limbs to wear them. Accustom, to tr accustom yourselves to trampling on the rights of others, you have lost the genius of your own independence and become the fit subjects of the first cunning tyrant who rises among you. You set the stage to be laid in your own snares. When you devalue someone else's freedom, you're actually devaluing your own. Because what's going to happen to you when they come for you, right? And before I even get into the next quote, there's a war of optics going on right now. You mentioned President Trump. And I'm not speaking politically. I'm just th speaking with truth from what I see and how I see that people are using. The enemy uses media, you know, to convince people of someone to, uh, for us to, to make an opinion on those people, to manipulate the minds of the public. According to the media, Donald Trump is the Antichrist, basically if you've been watching the news for, for the past four or five years. I don't respect a media that would demonize a man while covering up for other things. If you're going to demonize, do it equally. Amen? If you're going to criticize, do it equally. There's nothing wrong with criticizing. And I am fearful of our people being caught up in the optics of CNN and MSNBC and Fox News because they have agendas from so many levels, from a spiritual level to a corporate level to a ratings level, that the truth, it keeps taking a back seat to all these other things that are much more important. If you're going to be mad at someone. If you want to be mad at Republicans, hey, watch CNN, MSNBC. If you want to hate Democrats, go on over to Fox News or some of the independent um, uh, news sources. But I want to remind us that there is only one credible news source and that is Jesus Christ. That is, and the message that he has given us as a people. Freedom is very important to God. Uh, there's a quote in Nine Testimonies, uh, I believe it's page 19. talks about us being watchmen and light bearers. That's from Ezekiel 33. And now I'm talking about dependable news, reliable sources. The language of Ezekiel 33 is of a, of a watchman that is called to look out. And if there's a plague or a famine or or something coming on the land, a sword or an attack. That one is supposed to blow the trumpet, that the people be warned. And if the people listen, then they'll be saved. If they don't listen, well, they may be destroyed, but their blood will be on their own hands. And then he says, behold, I have set thee a watchman over the house of Israel. And that language is applied to us by Sister White in the quote about us being watchmen. Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. On them is shining wonderful truths from the word of God. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message is to be their work. There's no work of higher importance given among mortals. That's our work. So people need real news. That's real news. That's the real news that they need, but they want to settle, and I hate that they will settle for what's coming across from CNN, from MSNBC, from Fox News. Yes, even Fox News. If you want to see the vitriol that you saw in the, the previous administration, now the roles will be reversed. You have Biden, you will see Fox crank it up, and you will see CNN back off. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. You're going to see everything that MSNBC did and CNN, everything like, wow, they just won't give the president a break. Well, now it's going to switch over to Fox. And it seemed like Fox News was a part of the administration. Now that's going to switch over to CNN. We're being played with, and I don't want us to be played. What about the papacy? What does this system 
feel about the Constitution and its principles. This is a quote. It says, the absurd and erroneous doctrines or ravings in defense of liberty of conscience are a most pestilential area. What's error? The, the root word of pestilential is what? Pestilence, like COVID-19. It's something that's just a wicked plague. That's what he thinks, liberty of conscience. That's what he thinks of that. They are a most pestilential error, a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. That's from Pope Pius IX in his encyclical. Sister White writes, by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy, in violation of the law of God, our nation, the United States, will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach across the abyss, reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that, that, that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. That's from 2 Thessalonians. It'll be signs and lying wonders, optics. There'll be optics for you to consider. And I pray that you stay connected to the word of God. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy and the violation of the law of our God, the nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. Heaven is watching. Heaven is watching us. What does heaven want to see? You know how heaven feels about the taking of people's freedom? I can go over to Exodus chapter 3 and show you God calling Moses from a, from a burning bush. Showing the miraculous power of God, the presence of God. And after he commands him to take off his shoes because he's on holy ground, he deals with the issue of liberty. God does not take it lightly. Sends him with a message to Pharaoh to let his people go. And he starts it out by saying, tell him, I have seen the affliction of my people and have come to deliver them. When God sees it, how do you think he feels in those scenes that we saw? Did that bother you? How do you think he felt about that? How, does he, how do you think he feels when people are lording over people and acting like people are their property when, they, when God knows it's his property? Thou shalt not steal. Amen? People acting like they are the property of others. And you say that will never happen in America. And I'm promising you that it will. Based on the authority of the word of God. It has happened and it will happen. I don't say that, you know, with any degree of, of joy or delight. But it is happening. I want to look at a few more texts before we close. It's going to happen, y'all. And where is your shield? Who will be your anchor? I pray that it be the word of God. Because you're going to be like shifting sand watching the news. I have to turn it off. My wife knows. I talk back at the television and everything. Not that I'm crazy, but I can't stand people bearing false witness on others. There may be enough about Donald Trump that is true that you can talk about. You don't have to make up something else. There may be enough about Biden that is true. that You don't have to, you don't have to, 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 to heighten it. You don't have to add to it. We are not to bear false witness against our neighbors. And there's a lot of lies going on about people. And them being in the public does not make them uh, targets uh, or uh, deserving to be these kind of targets. And what you're seeing, if you enjoy the jabs taken at Trump, or if you enjoy the jabs taken at Biden, who's going to enjoy the jabs when they come at you? What you are watching is what is going to happen to you in the end. You're going to be maligned, misunderstood. Your motivation is going to be challenged. You're going to be made to look like evil. And it's going to look real. We didn't have any sympathy for those who it happened to. What's going to, who's going to have sympathy when it happens to us? We don't want to bear false witness. Satan counts on optics to charge God and his people. I'm, I'm so glad when I think about the false news that's going on uh, of the text that says, let God be true and every man a liar. God's word will stand, and there's only one reliable source. And it's not Brian Steltzer on CNN. The, the reliable source is Jesus Christ himself. 
He's an angel of the covenant, the messenger of the covenant. He has the message for us at this time. Psalm Proverbs 15, verse 3, talking about God's optics from his point of view. 15, verse 3, Proverbs. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 5, 21, for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his goings. Psalm 34, O taste and see, that's verse 8, that the Lord is good. This is a good message, right? This is something that we need to, 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 to put out there. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, there is no one to them that fear him. And we go down to verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are upon, open to their cry. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Now, optics are very important, but you need to also have a focus. Where should our focus be? Our focus should be in heaven. We have a, a high priest there. Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Was he the victim of a relentless campaign? He was the victim. He was smeared. He was maligned. And I don't think God looks any, kind, any, any kindlier, if that's the word, on us maligning anyone than he does his own son. Ken said earlier that he's no respect of a person. He doesn't allow anything to happen to you. I mean, if it happened to his son and he hated it, he doesn't want it to happen to you either. And he wasn't, doesn't want you to be caught up in it. I want to remind us for our close that heaven is watching. Who will you live for? <laughs> Who will be your audience today when you leave here? Are you living for an audience of one? You know, when you live for Jesus Christ, you may not be happy with the role that he assigns you to play. Uh, what about Brother Hosea, marry this prostitute, to illustrate how much God loves us. And despite our unfaithfulness, that's not a, that's not a, a legend. He really did that. God really asked him to do that. When you surrender to Christ, you surrender your very identity. Who are you going to live for? Who are you going to live for? Jeremiah, you... I'm calling you to preach for 40 years to a people that are not going to listen to you. Told them that in the, in the, in the, in the introductory interview. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to cast you in pits, and, and guess what? You're not going to get married. I need you to be totally devoted to this work. And Jeremiah, though he even fought it, he said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. I can't contain it. When God puts a vision or something in your heart, you can't get away from it, no matter how uncomfortable the enemy makes it. He tried it with Jesus Christ. He's going to try it with you. And I don't want you to be fooled with the three-card Monty of Satan's tricks. Heaven is watching. And don't settle for the high ratings on earth. Colossians 3 says, set your affections on things above, not on the things of earth. You're going to look like a fool here sometimes. It happened to Paul. But he was thankful to be able to say, even though I'm about to be beheaded, probably the next day, he said, henceforth, there's a crown laid up for me that I shall receive, and not only me, but all those who love his appearing. Those are the optics that I want to see. When faith shall become sight, when the Lord himself descends with a shout, I want to be able to see that and want to see it in peace. How about you? There was a woman at a well, got in a conversation with Jesus Christ, and he was stepping on her toes, talking about her five husbands, and the, the one she has now is not her husband, getting a little too personal. So she tried to back up a little bit with a little uh, banter, a little political banter, a little optics. You know, which mountain should we work in? Who's right? Who, should we worship in, in this mount, Mount Gerizim, or should we worship at Jerusalem? And Jesus said, uh, the time is, neither shall you worship in this mountain or in Jerusalem, but the time is coming, and now is, that the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For God seeketh such to worship him. If you're going to be seeker sensitive, worry about what God is seeking. If you're going to try to please someone, don't please the crowd. Please God. He is seeking true worshipers 
worshipers who are deeper than optics and attempts to draw people from him, people from him. I want to read that again for the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seeks such to worship him. But I'm here to remind you that he's not the only one seeking people to worship him. There's someone else who is contending heavily for your worship. We got to figure out every day who we're going to live for. This battle for your mind, which one of them, Satan or Christ, has evidence when they look at you on a daily basis and say, man, I'm winning. I'm winning the day with him. Boy, I'm winning with her. Have you considered my servant Carla? Have you considered my servant Chuck? Have you considered who's winning? Who's able to say, look at this evidence? Look, look at, at these optics. Is it Satan or Christ who is winning in the battle for your mind? Luke 22 and verse 31. I think of these words because we, we betray him. These words are to Peter. Jesus said lovingly to him. He said, Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Man, if he could just could have remembered those words. Right before that cock crew, right before that rooster crowed. If he just could have remembered this. He meant it when he said, I'll lay down my life for you. He would have passed the lie detector test. He meant it. He was not lying. He was ready for war. But he's willing, like many of us, to take a bullet for Christ, but not to die the slow death of a daily dying to self. And when it got rough for him, he started denying his Lord. But Jesus prayed for him. And he prayed for him that he would be converted. You think that God would answer a prayer like that coming from Jesus Christ? Verse 61 of that same chapter, it has, uh, you see Peter following Christ. Not as boldly as he did before we said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. But it says he followed him afar off. And that's what the enemy wants to do to you and to me. He doesn't mind. Satan says, you want to follow Jesus? That's okay. Just follow him afar off. Follow him where it's comfortable. Follow him where you won't get dirty and you won't get embarrassed. And that's what Peter was doing. That was his plan. And they called him out three times, and three times he denied his Lord. But then what about these, what about these optics in the eyes of Jesus Christ? Because when he denied him the last time, Jesus was there. Luke 22, verse 61 says, after that crop, after that um, rooster crowed, says, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Now, we think of Jesus like being still in a lineup, but it's chaos. They're pulling him. They're jerking him, and his eyes are just on you. His eyes were on Peter, and Peter saw that, and it, it hurt him. He heard, he knew that the Lord heard those words. I don't know that man. How might we be denying him today? And it says he, he remembered what Jesus said, and he went out and he wept how? Bitterly, like a child. Well, we know it, that Jesus turned it around for Peter. Jesus has turned it around for us time and time again. What is God looking for? As I'm closing, I want to just give you some points from Scripture. What is God looking for? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He's looking for humility. And if you, don't, if you don't humble yourself, he has a way of getting it to you. He can humble you. And I'm thinking in terms of a nation, I'm proud when I see the stars and stripes, but I know it won't be forever. There's only one kingdom that comes, and it, it's going to be an everlasting kingdom. And it's not this one. It's God's kingdom. And we have to realize that. We don't even need to let our patriotism come ahead of Jesus Christ. We will have to put that down when all things are under his feet. And that's even one of them. Until the end, we'll pray that our nation, we'll pray for our leaders, we'll pray that we will never give up these principles. But we have to be ready and understand that this is not going to last forever. They have an expiration date. But God wants to see some things while he's waiting. God loves a chill forgiver. Are, are, is he happy when he looks at your giving? The Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. And that doesn't mean it has, to be a, it has to be a lot, but you're cheerful in doing it and aiding the work of God. Is he happy when he looks at your life? Is he happy when he looks at mine? 
Jesus is pleased when he sees us ministering to the needs of those who he calls the least of these, his brethren. But before you get your checklist out, he's really interested more than the optics of you doing A, B, C, and D. He wants you to do it because he's transformed your heart. God wants to see us doing these things. Heaven is watching. You know what God really loves? And that's a part of the work that we've been called to. It says, great joy is there in heaven over one sinner that repents. Over one sinner who repents. That's a joy. That's what God wants to see. That's what I want on my life, power to call those people out of darkness. John said, I rejoice to see my children walking in the truth with a living faith. I love the name of this church. Not just a faith that is about optics, but a faith that is about real living faith, that is about reality. My last text I want us to consider is the worst thing, the worst optic from God's point of view. It was expressed in Matthew chapter 15. It says, this people honor me with their lips and draw nigh to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. Jesus wants our hearts. Don't let the enemy trick you into it. They honor me with their lips. They draw near to me with their mouth. Those are optics. But the reality he is seeking and empowering us to give is that our hearts will be right there with him, even when it's unfashionable, even when it costs us our very lives. Do you want this living faith? It's available. And I just love to think about people with the, I think about a living faith, I think about the Roman centurion who said, look, I'm not worthy that you come under my roof. Just speak a word. That was, that was one man said. Then this other man said, he said, look, I, I know that you have power because I'm a man also under authority, not a man with authority. He said under authority. And his basic explanation of how the kingdom of God works, it caused the eyes of omnipotence to do a double take. Jesus said, what? Jesus, who knows all, sees all. It's hard to surprise God. You can't surprise him. But Jesus marveled at this man and said, I have not found such great faith. No, not in Israel. This is the faith that I want. And this is the faith that I want you to have. That you're going to obtain it at the expense of bad optics. Attempts to be able to draw you away from what a true faith is. How many of you want this living faith? We're in the building. Let it be in our hearts. I pray for you as I pray for myself. If you have any special requests as I pray, please raise your hand. I'm thinking about freedom and deliverance, not only from, you know, the civil rights that all that was just a picture of the deliverance that God does for us when it comes to sin. I'm praying for, for, for people in my family, for people that I know. Maybe you want to pray for them as well. That's what I want to pray for as we close tonight, as we close today, that we would think about those who are captured and enslaved by sin and that they would have true liberty in Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful. Thankful, Lord, that you, though Christ is above all kingdoms, above nature, and above everything, that he counted us above all. Lord, I'm thankful that you don't leave us in the bondage of chains, or of, sla of slavery, or to sin. But I'm thankful that, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, we pray for a living faith for ourselves and for our loved ones. And as the optics that we view on a day-to-day -day basis crumble and fall, may Christ alone be exalted. May he have our hearts. He's purchased them at a dear price, and he deserves to have sole occupancy. Evict the devil from our hearts, from our homes, from our minds, Lord, as we choose Christ and Christ alone. Lord, we love you. Bless each person here. So thankful for those who have shown up. Encourage them and be with them in their daily walk that they would have a living faith. And when you watch them and you look at them, that you would marvel, that you would be so thankful to have them. And you would, we would be able to hear the words fall from your lips, well done, thy good and faithful servant. It won't be long. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.